Hello Rovers, Travis here, uh, back with a video topic that I think will be fairly popular uh, with the masses and we're going to be talking about how to execute a 2000 meter time trial on the indoor rower. And uh, I get this question a lot, I, it, it blows my mind how many athletes just kind of don't understand how to kind of maximize their performance either on a time trial or on any workout in general. But um, because this is such an important distance for evaluation in our sport, uh, I think it's warrants, uh, it warrants kind of sitting down and making a video just to talk about how I instruct my athletes to perform on this specific test distance. So the first thing that you want to be doing for your 2000 meter time trial is you, you got to warm up properly, all right? And so there's, there's all kinds of things that you can do for a warm up for that time trial. Um, assuming that you are fit and you're not just somebody who's kind of like doing a 2K because it's the trendy thing to do and you're kind of a recreational rower, you know, you rode 20, 30 minutes every once in a while and someone, you know, you know, said that uh, you should do a 2,000 meter or you want to do a 2,000 meter or your friends convinced you to do a 2,000 meter. All right, let's, let's assume that you are trained and you can get into a good warm up. And with that assumption, I'm saying that you are regularly rowing at least 40 to 60 minutes uh, on a, as a kind of average distance for your aerobic work. If that's the case, then your warm up should really be lasting somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes for, uh, for that time trial. And you want to start that warm up in the same way that I suggest warming up for everybody is I like to say kind of go hop on the erg and just go very slow and just start moving for about two to three minutes. All right, think about kind of like a, a brisk walk. All right, pace. And that's where you kind of want to start. And in this period, you want to really just be focusing on uh, the mechanics of your stroke, of getting in the right positions, making sure that you're moving properly, that your drive mechanics are solid, that your recovery mechanics are good, that you're relaxed. As you move through those first couple of minutes, you should be able to loosen up and shift into what I would call like a speed walk pace, all right? So still walk very fast. Imagine kind of like getting, trying to get a connection in the airport, but you're not quite at a point where you're like, I'm going to sprint through the airport. You're just like, I'm going to go with some sense of urgency. All right. Continue that focus. Technically let your body continue to kind of loosen up and warm up. And then after that, you know, first five, six minutes or so, then you're going to shift into what I call just a comfortable jog pace. All right. So a little bit faster, you're still much slower than kind of a base steady state pace, or at least a little bit slower than base steady state pace. You're continuing to allow the body to loosen and go. And then once you get about seven to nine minutes or so in, then you can kind of start to ease in and settle into whatever kind of a standard UT2 steady state type pace would be for you, all right? And then you wanna spend somewhere between maybe five and 10 minutes at that pace, all right? 10 minutes would be a stretch. Maybe if you're really fit, then 10 minutes necessary. Five minutes or so, five, six minutes should be enough uh, to spend at that UT2 pace. And then I would shift at the end of that into a UT1 pace, all right? So I would just subtly shift into UT1 and row at that UT1 pace for anywhere from one to three minutes, all right? And so the UT1 is just kind of like quick, tappy, steady state up in the kind of 22 to 24 range. Um, you know, it's still very aerobic. Uh, you know, it should be comfortable. You know, I consider UT1 to kind of be a, a fun pace, all right? Because you're still aerobic. You're not dealing with that lactate burn, uh, but you're going quick, all right? You know, it's fun. Uh, and then after that, one to three minutes of UT1, then you can stop, get up, stretch, do any kind of mobility work that you're used to doing, uh, you know, get some water. Um, and uh, once you've kind of like, you know, you're feeling loose, you've got all the stretches you need to do. Um, and I wouldn't spend super long on those stretches, all right? Maybe five, six minutes, like if you have any particular mobility issues that you need to address, do those at that time. But a key thing to remember in your warm up is that once you've stopped moving for about five, six minutes, you're losing the vast majority of the benefits of that warm up activity, all right? So you don't really want to kind of warm up and then sit. And warm up for on the water rowing, 
uh, our sport is just, it's a huge crutch in our sport because it's so hard to get good warm-ups on the water. A lot of times you have 1,200 meters to row before you're at the start of the race course and there's no room on the water for everybody to be doing their custom warm-up. So you just gotta get in and go. And if you do a warm-up on land, well, you, you're taking a long break to get your boat in the water and to launch and all that fun stuff. So that's an issue and we're not gonna address that. So on land, you don't have that problem. Or on land, you really want to minimize downtime that you have between your uh, your warm up, later parts of the warm up, or your final performance on that 2,000 meters. All right, so you've done that, you've done your mobility, hop back on the erg, and this is when you want to kind of do some light build, not light builds. You want to do some pace work builds to uh, get into the groove for that 2,000 meter piece or similar distance. Now. On your 2000 meter piece, you don't need to be doing any kind of starts. You don't need to be doing any kind of high sprints, all right? What you want to be doing is you want to be doing maybe 10 to 20 strokes. Personally, I like 12 to 15, all right? You know, with an heavy emphasis on 12. 12 stroke builds, um, just enough to kind of get the body loose and moving, but not enough to really create you know, any kind of fatigue. All right, and so you are, uh, you know, it is pace work, all right? And what you want to do with those builds is you want to just practice your base pace, whatever that might be for your 2000 meter, and hopefully you have a rough plan of what that base pace should be. Um, and you just want to build to that race pace. Take two or three strokes to build, settle in at the split and at the target stroke rate that you want to be holding for the base of that 2000 meters. Do that once, rest. 90 seconds or so until you're totally fresh, you totally caught your breath, do it again. Do that two to three times, all right? And again, you don't need to be start practicing starts, all right? The practice, when we practice starts and rowing on the water before a race, the emphasis, the reason we're doing that is technical, all right? We're doing that to, to get technically sharp and precise and even more important is to kind of be able to effectively build into your base rhythm from a dead stop which is a very which is a very technically demanding skill to do on the water to create rhythm all right on the erg it's a little bit easier to do that all right so we don't have to kind of do a start and honestly when we get to how we're going to do that 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 erg that 2000 meter time trial um, we're not going to do a traditional rowing start all right and we'll talk about that in a moment so you got two to three builds you know take a break stay loose and then this last part is optional, all right? This last part I would do for athletes that are well conditioned and fit. If you're more of a recreational athlete, then I don't necessarily recommend this. Maybe if you did it, do it shorter. But I would recommend doing a three minute piece at a comfortable transport pace, or maybe you could say, you know, an, a somewhat aggressive AT pace, all right? So a three minute piece, you know, in a transport pace, I would say for me, if I was doing this, let's say I'm basing, you know, in the kind of um, higher 130s for a 2000 meter, if I were to do a three minute piece, I would maybe do that three minute piece at about a 146, 145, and I would keep the stroke rate low, all right? So keep the stroke rate somewhere around a 24. Um, and so you're basically going to do this three minute piece at a 24. It's going to be firm, all right, but you're not going, you're not maxing out, all right? It's basically an extended build, all right? And that pace is going to be, you know, if you've done 6Ks, maybe about at or slightly faster than your 6K pace. Slightly faster, maybe a second or two faster than what your 6K pace for that three minute piece. And what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to kind of facilitate your body's priming for that anaerobic effort that is to come. And if people have done, I, I think anybody who's done intervals and repetitions uh, and paces that properly will understand that when you get in and you do those intervals, if you, uh, your first interval, you're always kind of still kind of not fully kind of warmed up. It's almost like an extended warm up. And generally you get through that, uh, you know, you feel good firm. You're definitely not maxing out because you don't want to fly and dive through that workout. And then on that second piece, that second piece inevitably feels so much looser and more relaxed and more comfortable, all right? And that's because you need that kind of some, somewhat extended anaerobic stimulus to really prime the body for 
that level of work, all right? And so when I'm doing intervals, we always kind of think about that first interval almost assuming they're short. I mean, if you're doing two by 6K, you can't be taking it easy for the entire first interval, but you can at least kind of ease into it at the beginning of the first interval. But you want to just kind of, it's a conservative anaerobic effort at that pace. And so you're going to do three minutes at that point. And so for me, for people that like, you know, a fixed number, I'm saying I would do this somewhere between maybe seven seconds slower than what my target pace is for that 2000 meter. I'm going to spend three minutes there. I'm going to be doing at a stroke rate in that 24 range. Don't let it go up. All right. You don't want to kind of be spinning your wheels and you don't want to be going too hard because the stroke rate is high. So 24 is fine. Get it go. And then your goal from there, after you finish that three minute piece, your goal is to start your 2000 meter time trial or similarly distance time trial approximately six minutes or so after the end of that interval. All right, so plus or minus two minutes. If you're super fit, maybe four or five minutes would be fine. If you're less fit, stay within that six, seven minute range. All right, and now we're finally to kind of the main events. All right, we're at that 2000 meter. All right, and again, I'm gonna focus, I'm gonna talk about 2000 meters. Most of these principles can be applied to distances down to 1000 meters and up to whatever head race distances are typical. All right, but 2000 meters. All right, the main thing we wanna do on this 2000 meters is to create a strong, sustainable base pace. All right, there's a couple principles actually that before we dive into that, I wanna kind of digress on. One is that, uh, Power 10s, power 20s, uh, builds, um, you know, start sequences, highs, um, all these things are tactical things that are specific to the water, all right? These things do not translate to an endo rower in a 2000 meter time trial, all right? You never want to just surge on a time trial on the indoor rower and then settle back ideally to whatever your base pace is. It's an extremely inefficient use of your energy. And actually one of my first video, I think it was my second ever video, I did a very detailed uh, discussion about why it is invaluable to evenly pace um, your, your workouts, whether it was steady state, whether it's a maximal effort workout. I use 2000 meters as the example and I'll put that video I never know which corner it pops up in, but check out that white box that pops up if you want a really detailed discussion of why even pacing is, is important on a physiological level, all right? Why it's easier, why it's gonna maximize your performance. But um, let's go back and say, one, all those builds, all those power 20s, all those big moves, all right? Those do not apply in your time trial environment, all right? Because you're, when you're time trialing, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. You're not competing psychologically as well as uh, athletically with other people. If you're on the water, you're doing moves to kind of affect the psychology of other boats or affect your psychology in relation to those other boats that doesn't come into play on that end all rower, all right? So it's a, even you're creating the strongest base pace possible, all right? You will make what I would call shifts, all right? So you may at points shift up in your effort or your focus or your speed, um, but you are not gonna do suddenly this 10 or 20 stroke, you know, burst and then come back down to a base, all right? It's, it's a very bad idea and in that video that I put up there, that will explain why, all right? But there are, one, you want to have a good sense of what your pacing is, all right? And most athletes surprisingly have no idea how to, how to plan what they should be doing for 2,000 meters. And, and I feel like I could talk for 30 minutes just on this, so I'm going to try to make this as succinct as possible. Um, you need to look to your training and look to efforts that are similar to your 2,000 meter and you need to basically use those, those training sessions to deduce what is a realistic pace for you to sustain, all right? And I'm talking realistic, all right? In my last video, I talked a lot about kind of goal setting. Um, I didn't dive so much into the, the concept of setting arbitrary uh, performance goals for things like 2,000 meters, of saying, well, I wanna break 
I want to break seven minutes or I want to pull a 620 because that's what I need to do to get recruited to college or you know I my mom tells me that I should pull this or my friends tell me I should pull this those are all arbitrary all right the only the only goals for that 2000 meter performance that matter are goals that are based on your training performance and extrapolate it all right so if you did one of the workouts that I like to do and I had another video where I talked about kind of a prep workout for uh, rowing as doing a 1000 meter reps all right I like to do two to three 1000 meter reps at your target base pace generally about six days or so five or six days before a 2000 meter time trial with full rest um, and at your at a very slightly than your target pace <clears throat> Um, and then uh, that is a very good predictor. So generally the two slowest or the fastest and the slowest of those 1000 meter reps is going to put you within four or five seconds of what you're going to do on a 2000 meter time trial. So, or if you're just doing uh, training, if you're doing transport training, which God hope you're doing transport training before you test 2K, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. Um, so if you're doing, if you're used to doing three minute pieces and you're doing three minute pieces uh, and you're doing, let's say six or seven, three minute pieces and you're finishing those three minute pieces, let's say the last few are at a 28 to 30 stroke rate and you're pulling, you know, 142, 141 on that, you know that on your 2000 meter, um, you're just, I mean, you're just going to be going, it's going to be about six and a half to seven minutes, um, of speed, uh, on that 2000 meter, you know, for X person and um and your stroke rate is going to be a 34 all right so you can say well if i was holding like a 142 at a at a 30 32 maybe for those transport sessions and i'm going to be doing a 34 and i'm going to be stepping into that next gear because it's a race then let's say my target split's going to be like you know let's say a 139 all right so a little bit faster than you were on that transport um uh you know and it's going to be a little bit faster than you were able to do on that transport because um, it's a race effort, it's not a training effort, and your stroke rate's gonna be a little bit higher. All right, so that's kind of the planning for that target pace. But you wanna, so you wanna have that plan, all right? You wanna have that target split going into that 2,000 meters. And I say that at the very beginning, all right, so how you wanna start that piece, you wanna take five strokes, maybe six, maybe four, definitely not more than six, as hard as you possibly can to get that flywheel moving and to jack that split as low as you can all right so four or five strokes i wouldn't go more than five unless you're a highly trained athlete four or five is fine for the majority of people as hard as you can get that split down as far as you can hopefully bring that average split down as far as you can as well and then you need to immediately relax and get to that target pace as quickly as possible, all right? So 140 is an easy, easy split to talk about. It's nice and even. So let's say my target for 2000 meters is a 140 split. I'm gonna take that first four or five strokes as hard as I can coming off the start. You don't need to do your like half, half, three quarter full or whatever, all right? I would abbreviate the first stroke, maybe go like three quarters or so. I like to say the first stroke, you should not be compressed to the point where your heels are coming off the stretcher. You want a firm placement in the heels. You want to make sure that you're sitting tall, your arms are very long, and that you have a direct connection on that first stroke. And then that second stroke should be a shorter stroke, doesn't necessarily have to be half or quarter or whatever. Just make it a little bit shorter to kind of give that flywheel another extra boost after that first stroke. And then you want to lengthen each stroke after that until you get to whatever your main length is. Um, but four or five strokes, as hard as you can, and then immediately settle. Now this settle is kind of, in a lot of ways, kind of the most important thing you're going to do in that piece, all right, because it's really going to set you, set you up, and it's really where a majority of the errors are going to happen in that piece, all right? So at the beginning of a time trial like this, you are going to be pumped, all right? The adrenaline is flowing, whether it's good energy, whether it's super nervous energy and you're just like totally anxious, it's still energy, all right? Your adrenaline is pumping, you're going. And the result of that is that things feel easy, all right? You get into that beginning of that 2K, let's say your target is 140, all right? Let's say your PR before is a 141, maybe 141 and a half, 142. You're confident that 140 is a good target for you now. Well, I guarantee you, 
that you could pull a 135 for 100, 200 meters and feel great, all right? You're not gonna feel it at all, all right? And you do not wanna do that because just because it doesn't feel hard does not mean that your body is miraculously not producing a 135's worth of lactic acid while you're pulling that 135, all right? You are creating that lactic acid, all right? And so when you come off of that first five strokes, if your target is a 140, then you need to immediately relax and settle in to that 140 split. And now the trick is gonna be not under stroking with your stroke rate to do this, all right? Let's say my target stroke rate is gonna be a 34, 35 at a 140, all right? You don't wanna be rowing at a 130 and kind of pounding it out you know, to get to that 140 split because you feel like if you pulled at 34, 35, you're gonna be pulling that 135, 136. You have to relax, all right? You have to make it feel easy and it will feel easy, all right? You know, your, once you get through that first build, you should feel extremely comfortable. It should not feel hard for at least 150, 200 meters, all right? You should be focused in that period about creating a very relaxed, easy rhythm at your base pace, all right? And if you fail to do this, if you keep pulling that 135 for 150, 200 meter strokes, and you're like, I just can't settle, I just can't settle, you will suffer for that later on. And that's a skill, and that's something that you can practice um, previously, either in your builds as part of your warm up or just after workouts, uh, you know, a couple times a week, three, four times a week. Just do some builds to your race cadence and that target race pace to practice rowing that 140 split at a 34, 35 stroke rate, all right? So you need to be used to it. You need to practice. You need to know how it feels. And when you come out of that first five strokes and you settle, you need to get there as soon as possible. The longer you spend faster than a race pace, the more you're gonna accumulate lactate and that lactate will come back to haunt you in that last third of that 2,000 meter piece, all right? You know, the pain is gonna come a lot faster because it's sitting there, you know, it is acid, it is corroding and damaging your muscles as you go, all right? So, that's it. You have to settle, all right, as soon as possible. It's okay if it feels like you're not doing any work at all. Your priority is get to that base pace, to that 140. Even if you do have to come bring down the stroke rate a little bit, at first, that's fine, but do get to yourself to where you settle into your base cadence as well as your base split. But the number one priority is get to that base split. All right, so you're there, you're into it, you've settled into that base pace, and you're cruising for that first couple hundred meters. You're in that honeymoon period where you're still cruising on the adrenaline of the fact that you're about to do this 2K. You're at the very beginning, so you haven't developed a lot of lactic acid. It's not hard yet. Enjoy it. It's not gonna last, all right? But I would say, that you want to be able to get through about the first third or so of that piece feeling very much in control of your pace. It should not feel um, strenuous, all right? You should not be struggling to hold your base rhythm, all right? So theoretically, we've done a good job. 140 is the pace that we should be doing for this, and we're cruising at that 140. It's getting a little bit harder with each 100 meter that passes, but it's still well within your effort level. You're not having to recruit kind of your kind of your grit um, in order to continue at that pace, all right? You're still in a place where immensely all your energy can be focused on rhythm, all right? Making that 140 feel as easy as possible, all right? You're not gonna be in there and say, well, oh, I, I'm, I wanna pull 138 because I'm feeling great today, so I'm gonna pull a 138, no. No matter what, you stay at that 140 for that first third and you make it feel as easy as possible. And if you're like, I, this is super easy, I'm heaven, don't worry, we're gonna talk about how to take advantage of that in a little bit, all right? Actually, that little bit is right now, all right? So you get through that first third, all right? And I always say somewhere between the seven and 800 meter um, point in that 2,000 meters, that's where you are gonna step back and completely evaluate your decision making and your pacing uh, with regard to your pace from the beginning, all right? So about seven, 800 meters into that piece, you are moving out of that honeymoon period, all right? You have been rowing long enough that it is not easy anymore, that you're having to really focus on that pace, but you haven't been rowing long enough 
that that kind of lactate devil on your shoulder is popping up saying, this isn't really worth it. Why are you here? Uh, it's okay to slow down and it's okay to stop, all right? And we all have that little voice inside of our head as we get deeper into a maximal effort, all right? Seven, 800 meters into a 2,000 meter piece, that voice is not loud enough to affect our, our logic and our good decision-making skills, all right? And so, seven, 800 meters in, you need to look at what's been happening in that piece so far. So let's say for me, 140 was my target split. If I get through that seven, 800 meters and I've been right on that 140 and I'm feeling good with my rhythm, um, I'm hitting my target stroke rates, I'm right at that 140, I'm feeling confident and strong, then I'm gonna say, all right, we're continuing on with the plan. And I make that decision is that no matter what happens for the next uh, eight, 900 meters, all right, I'm gonna hold that 140. I'm gonna hold it at this stroke rate, 140 at that 34, 35. All right, that's the easy one. The other two alternatives is that you're going through that first seven, 800 meters and you are constantly hitting 139, 139, 138, 139, 139, and you're constantly telling yourself, relax, 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 bring it back to the 140, bring it back to the 140, all right? And so I would say your, de I would call that your deviation. Your deviation is on the fast side. You're constantly bouncing, all right? Because we're, you know, unless you're extremely highly skilled rower, you're not gonna hit a 140 every stroke, all right? It's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. All right, 140 is gonna be the average, all right? So if you're, when you're deviating, if you're constantly deviating faster, all right, then you're in a good place. And so you can then get to that seven, 800 meters and say, okay, I'm still constantly hitting that 139, 138, but I'm feeling like that, I'm feeling like that's okay, all right? I've gotten through that honeymoon phase, I'm deep into that effort, I'm feel, I have a really good rhythm, and I feel confident that I can now resettle into that 139. I wouldn't go to the 138, just go to the 139, and then reestablish that base, and again, Make the commitment to yourself that no matter what, you are gonna hold that 34, 35, and you are gonna hold that 139, all right? That is your new fight, all right? So you've shifted that slightly. And then you continue. The other end, what if your deviation is below? What if you're rowing and you're hitting, you're going for that 140, and you constantly start bouncing down to that 141, 142 range, all right? Constantly, and you're like, oh, I gotta get a little more press on it, get to that 140, and then it slips down, 141. Press a little bit, get back to that 140. Um, in that case, then your body is telling you that you're not gonna have an optimal performance that day, or maybe we were a little bit too aggressive on your on your plan for that performance all right so and and if that's happening if that's doing that a lot and you're getting past the first four or five hundred meters and you're still bouncing down to that 141 you're still constantly having to press then within that be comfortable with it all right you should not be fighting remember you're trying to make that 140 as easy as possible throughout that first seven eight hundred meters and if that 140 isn't easy if you keep hitting that 141 then be okay with that, all right? Still try to keep yourself as close to that 140 as possible, but once you get into that seven, 800 meters, you've rode long enough to be like, all right, this is what my body is telling me. My body is telling me I need to readjust to a 142 or a 141, and that needs to be my new base for the next eight, 900 meters in this piece, all right? And make that adjustment, make that call, be okay with it, but again, Make the call then, all right? Decide, is it a 141? Is it a 142? Is it a 143 that you need to settle into that you feel like you can sustain for twice the distance that you have already rode, all right? For another eight, 900 meters, all right? You're gonna be holding that pace. Again, you're deep enough into that piece where you're feeling the effort, but you're not so deep that that little voice in your head is gonna be giving you bad advice. That the little voice may be saying, back off, it's okay. This isn't that important. You don't need to do this, this really hurts. I'd rather be watching TV or anything else right now. That voice is not loud enough to affect your decision making. So make that decision and then go. And then we've gotten past that point, all right? We're 850, 900 meters in. We've made our decision, we've made our commitment, and then you need to just buckle down, all right? Things are gonna start to get hard, all right? 
Each 100 meters is gonna be harder than the last. Whatever you need to do to click off those 100 meters. I'm a counter myself, so I count to 10, 12 for every 100 meters, and I just like keep closing my eyes and keep counting and just keep trying to get to all those benchmarks, all right? Whatever those mental strategies are that you need to do, you maintain that. You do not, all right, you do not do power 10s, power 20s at the 1,000 meter mark, all right? You do not do power 10s, power 20s to get you back into that split. You just maintain it as best as you can. And when you're slipping, then you kind of force back in. And you can, if you're mature, and you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm now 1,300, 1,400 meters in, I've been holding this 140, and that's the decision I made. I was gonna stick at that 140. And I'm starting to see a lot of 141s then be okay with that, all right? You know, you can hold, if that 140 is gonna take a little bit more effort than you're prepared to do with six, 700 meters left in the piece and 141, you feel confident in that you can sustain that, then 141, 140, 141, 140, allow that little deviation, all right? Click off the meters, get yourself to that 300 meter mark, all right? And that 300 meter mark is where the big things are gonna happen, all right? That's gonna be where you're gonna start to accelerate and when you're gonna start to move, all right? So I, I would say that there's kind of a, a two-part shift here. The first part coming around that 300 meters, all right? If you are maybe a master's athlete, a slower athlete, make that a little bit closer to the finish line, all right? Because I'm going based on time. I'm saying 300 meters is gonna take me about a minute or so to complete, all right? So for you, it takes you about a minute to complete 225 meters, then aim for that kind of about where that minute mark as kind of that first shift you know, towards that finish line. So at that point, all right, you're gonna basically create a push, all right? You're gonna stop holding back, all right? You know, things are hard, all right? You're in deep lactate debt, but you're close enough to that finish line that it can be a motivator. So at that point, you're no longer, there's no longer any excuses. You are gonna hold that base and you're gonna be doing everything you can to get maybe a little extra second, all right? If I'm at 140, then I'm doing whatever I can to get 139. 138, all right? I'm not gonna jack the stroke rate just yet. I'm maybe gonna shift up, or not maybe, I am gonna try to shift up two beats or so, at least on that stroke rate, all right? Shifting up to that 36, 37 point to try to get that extra second or two off of my split, kind of ramping up to the end. Again, the end is close. I'm within a minute, all right? I can do anything for a minute, all right? Just push, just start counting strokes, all right? You've got about 30, 35 strokes left. If you're 300 meters away, just start counting and start pushing. Close your eyes if you need to. I'm a big eye closer. Um, I just close my eyes and I count and I go, all right? So make that shift, all right? Do that for about 10 to 15 strokes. And then once you get that 10, 15 strokes in, once you're about 150 meters away from that finish, you can maybe extend it to 100 meters. It's okay to do that, all right? get to within either 100 or 150 meters, and then you go, all right? That's when you gotta empty your tank, all right? And this is a big mistake that inexperienced rowers go. Rate it is not power itself, all right? Do not jack up, do, or do not make the decision just to jack the rate, all right? Because you can easily jack the rate and not get the split down. Your goal is to Get those knees down as fast as possible. And if you wanna shorten your stroke a little bit, go to three quarters as you get close to that finish line, go to half, that's fine. As long as you are pushing those knees down as hard as you can, all right, that will increase your stroke rate, all right? So your stroke rate will go up because you're jamming that drive and you're getting down as fast as you can. You don't wanna sit there and be like, jack the rates, all right, because you can jack the rate without increasing drive speed and you'll either go the same split or faster. You don't wanna do that, all right? Especially if you're on the water rower, that's a horrible habit to get into, all right? The boat, you must always increase stroke rate by increasing boat speed and the way you increase boat speed is by driving those legs. And that's it, you drive to the finish. Last 100, last 150 meters, if you're really, really good sprinter and you're into it, you know, maybe you can kind of make another shift with 200 meters to go, but for the most part, emptying that tank is reserved for the last 100 meters, right? Look at look at track sprinters, right? Usually don't fit shift into that final gear into the last that last straightaway on the track uh, in any kind of distance, right? That's kind of your reserved, your absolute maximal sprint. You finish that piece and you're done. That's 2000 meters, all right? So, um, hopefully that helped.
All right, that's it. I kind of like an abrupt start to what ended up being a very long video, but this is an important subject, obviously, in rowing. Um, and uh, the devil is in the details. But that's it, 2,000 meters. Um, I would take essentially the exact same approach to a 1,000 meter. All right, I would take these. I would make your decisions in the 1,000 meter at about 400, 450 um, into that piece. Uh, you definitely want to uh, race at a higher cadence uh, because cadence is speed in 1,000 meters. Um, the cadence is gonna be higher. Um, and then you will probably save that sprint for a little bit closer to the finish. So maybe definitely, definitely last 100 or so. Um, maybe make that final, that first shift into the sprint at 200 meters instead of 300 meters uh, because everything at your base pace is going to be a lot faster in general. Um, but otherwise, how you do the start, five strokes as hard as you can, settle into your base, make your decision at 400 meters, get to the last 100, 150 meters, and then sprint for the line for 1,000 meters. That's what you should do. Uh, head race. Same thing, all right? Same thing, all right? You're settling into a different base, all right? You know, about 40% of the way in, make a decision. Maybe on a longer race, maybe you can make that decision closer to a third of the way, uh, maybe a little bit before a third of the way in. Um, so if I was doing a 6K, I would be making those decisions around a 1500 meter point in terms of where my pacing is and if I need to adjust the plan. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but the idea, the general idea is the same, all right? 6,000 meters of stroke rate is just gonna be a, bit, a little bit less, and because of that, your speed's gonna be a little bit less. But that's it. That is time trialing on the indoor rower uh, where you're on a fixed, fixed basis, you know, little power 10s, power 20s, whatever you wanna call them, shifts um, to kind of either break the opponents or throw them off or give yourself a psychological edge and make a move. None of that matters on the indoor rower. It's, it's about establishing rhythm and establishing base and then pushing that rhythm and base and getting the most out of it that you can and that's it all right that's my tree to z uh i hope that helped um if it did give it a thumbs up all right share it with somebody else uh on your team another uh, another rower um uh, subscribe to the channel if you uh found this very helpful you're not subscribed already and you want to see more content like this and if you have uh input you know, if you have another way that you think is better, throw it in the comments below. You know, let's debate a little bit. I'm always happy to do that. Or if you want to say, hey, good job, Travis. I really appreciate it. I always like a little attaboy too. So throw that in the comments below as well. And uh, that's it. So this is Travis signing off. And uh, we'll catch you on the next video. Bye.